In the previous lecture, we talked about uh, a bit about types and uh, type theory in, in general. Uh, we saw that type theory provides an alternative formulation of set theory. And um, together with, um, with lambda calculus, which provides an alternative formulation of logic, we have a really nice uh, setup to do some advanced theoretical work. Um, and we, we sort of looked very briefly at what this implies and, and, um, and that there existed a uh, beautiful mathematical uh, correspondence between mathematical proofs uh, and theorems and, and um, lambda calculus and, uh, and types, where types are the theorems and the lambda calculus are the correspond to the proofs. Now, this is all very theoretical and we're not going to be concerned with these things at all in any depth, but these things ha do have practical um, implications. And one really cool thing that the, you, one can look up in, in Haskell is a uh, system called GIN by Lennart Augustsson. And, um, and where we are normally, when we're working with Sharp, we have type inference, where we type some code and the compiler will figure out what the type should be. What Jin does is the opposite. You type some, you write down the type and it will figure out what the implementation should be. Now this only, of course, it works in, in uh, very special cases, but it shows us a little bit of the power of types as well. That was, a, that was just a digression, so now let's just get down to the business with the types in F-sharp. And we have already seen types uh, in, in many places, but now let's just look at them uh, slightly more um, in detail. So, in principle we can say we have, we have uh, some really, we have some simple types. I'll just call them simple types. That's stuff like int and car and float and uint32 and so on and so on. And these are operationally important things because they correspond to, to, um, to types that also exist in the processor. So that we need to make sure that when, when we feed instructions inside the processors with a certain uh, bit length, they correspond to these types. And these are important regardless whether you have a type system or not. Uh, whenever you want to send some instructions to the processor, you need to know what, what type uh, these are. I'm going to include one which isn't really a simple type, but it's, it sort of fits in, in the same category in F sharp, which is string. Now, string is, of course, a variable length, uh, in principle, a, a list of, of characters but we can pretty much consider it as a, as a simple type when we program. So this is one category of types we've seen, and there's plenty more. Uh, of course, bool is an important one, <laughs> not to forget the bool. Um, so then we have the function types, which we have also seen. Where we have things like f int to float or g uh, string int string and so on. Where we have this is a function where we have this as a function of one variable taking an integer returning a float, a, a function return taking a string, returning a function, returning a, taking an int, returning a string, or a multivariate function. Often when we, do, though when we write code, we will see that we have something like, we see before the compiler figures things out, we will have stuff like saying prime A to prime B. And these things with the prime A in front of it are generic type placeholders, type variables. They're not values, they're types. And, and they can get replaced with pretty much anything which fits, uh, fits, which fit, fits so that 
uh, so that the types like match up to, to whatever we are calling and doing. And, um, and while we can do these things for functions uh, explicitly, we normally don't. Uh, but these are very important, uh, we will see in a, in a little second. One thing that we could say about function, the function types, um, which is a little sort of sidetrack, but it's kind of important to know about, I'm going to remove the simple types here, <clears throat> is that normally when we define a function like this, and we say, okay, we have a, an f which takes an int and returns a float. Then we expect to be able to call f with an integer of 1, and it will return 42.0. And the same for g, we would call g with uh, foo 5, and it would return something. But there's a variant of, for this g uh, type of function, which allows us to, do, uh, because this is in so-called prefix notation. So this is the prefix saying this is the function to call, and these are the argument. But there's a way, way of defining um, function in infix notation. So we can say let parenthesis, and that parenthesis there is mandatory, and then we can define an, a new function and here we have to be a little bit careful because we can't use any characters. So we need to, to specify uh, from a particular set. But let's make a special kind of addition. So I'm going to call it dot plus dot. And it's going to take a A and a B. And this is going to be an integer and that's going to be an integer. The compiler will infer that first. And then I can say, well, okay. So this is going to be 2 times a plus b. So this is a special addition which uh, doubles whatever we give it. Now, now, when I define a function like this, I can actually type code like 5 dot plus dot 10, which in this case would give us 30. 5 plus 10, 15, double it. So now I can actually define this function that will take the first argument from there and the second argument from there. And in fact, all of our infix functions, like minus and plus and multiply and divide and so on that we have, are in principle defined like this. And, and the cool thing is that, and why this is useful, mostly useful, like, this is a cool gimmick that you can define your own operators, but the really useful thing of this is, is that these functions here can also be called explicitly in prefix notation by including the parentheses. Which means that instead of saying 1 plus 2, I can say parentheses plus parentheses end 1, 2. Which is exactly the same. And any Lisp programmer would feel right at home uh, writing things like this. And the nice thing about this is now that we write it like this, is that we can actually partially apply, for example, multiply. So I could say, uh, let double, well, that's a key, that let, um, let double it equals multiply two. So now I have a function called double it, which I have created by partially applying um, multi the multiply to two. Um, and this might seem a little bit silly, but once we start working with the higher order functions like map and so on, this comes in very handy. So that was a little sidetrack on function the function type and how we can define a function in F sharp. Okay. We've seen the primitive types, we've seen the function type, um, and we've seen some generic types. And that brings us to the real use of these things, and that's for what we could call container types. Types which provide some structure and contain other types. So one of the container types we've already seen 
is of course the tuple. So we could define a pair of int as 1, 2. Or if we write the type for this thing, we would write int star int. That's the type. Actually, I don't need a parenthesis. I just said that's the type, int times it. Now, if you look at this a tuple like this, uh, it would be kind of, well, impossible, really, to uh, have a predefined set of tuples, overloaded set of tuples for every conceivable pair that there exists. Like, this is one type, int uh, float is another one, int string is another one, and so on and so on and so on. And all the types that you could invent, uh, there's an infinite number of these pairs. So we need a way of, of defining a pair in, in a generic way, so we can say a pair of anything, really. And that's when these generic uh, variables come in handy, because that allows us to define a single pair of A, B, and let the compiler implement the actual thing for us. And the, the whole idea with this is actually that the, a pair is a pair, regardless of what we pair up. Like, that doesn't have anything to do with the pairiness. The same goes for lists. A list is a list of things, regardless what we list. Like, lists of ints and floats and so on. It doesn't matter, we can just look at the list and ignore the contents. And then so the listiness is, is, is completely generic. In the same way, a pair is completely generic. So that's where we use these things. Now, <clears throat> there are two ways of... Um, if we take a if we take look at, um, at the list... So if I want to define something to be a, a list of something... The list type is in principle written like this. List some type t. So if I now want to define something to be a list of integers, I could say uh, list oh, let let uh, my list my, my list and I can say this is a list of int by giving it an explicit uh, type annotation, I could also let the compiler figure this out for me, but I can say my list has the type list of int and I could say one, two, three. So here I've written down that this should have the type where I've said specialize this generic t into an int. Similarly, if I would have a list of uh, strings or floats, I would just put in that type. Or if I had created some own, own type foo, I would say a list of foo and that would be it. But they're all of the same type. So we can't mix things in, inside of a list. In the tuple though, that was defined as A, B. And these are different types. So for pairs, and we can put in whatever we want. Then we can have list int, int and string and so on. Now, this notation here, where we use these angle brackets here to say how to specialize a, a generic type, that's one way of doing it. But there's another way, which is the one I prefer personally, because I don't like angle brackets. I think they hurt my eyes. They're very pointy. Uh, you can cut your fingers on them. Um, so there's an OCaml legacy way of doing things, which is a lot of F-sharp programmers um, prefer. And I can write the exact same type signature like this. int list or uh, float array as so. Note that I have a little, uh, little L here and a capital L there and that's because of library silliness in 
there are two different ways, two different uh, list modules in, in F sharp. This is basically the C sharp one, and this is the F sharp one, and there's, yeah, technical little details, nothing to worry about. So, so now we've looked at, at uh, how sort of ge generic type specifications work. Um, there's one thing we haven't looked at yet, and that's an important thing, and that's the record type. Now, the record type is a collection of named elements, but in essence, it's the same as a tuple a two-tuple, three-tuple, four-tuple, five-tuple, n-tuple, uh, but with a, with a slightly different syntax and the fact that you can name them, which makes it easy to access and pick out stuff from, from record types, which is kind of hard with, with tuples. So tuples are usually normally like you have one, two, or three elements on them and that's it. Whereas record types can have really plenty. So let's see how we can define a a, uh, a record type. But first, let's look at uh, briefly at just generally um, on types. Um, in order to create your own types in F-sharp, we say type and a name, so I can say type uh, message equals string. And this says, the new type I created message is a string. Well, it turns out that this is actually a type alias. So anywhere where I would use message, I could use string. They're equivalent. There's, there's, there's nothing uh, peculiar about it. Um, in the next lecture, we will see how we can, how we can uh, sort of rectify that so that we can turn message into a distinct, unique type. But for now, then we just say message is a string. And we'll see how this is useful in a little moment. We could say something like type count equals int. Let's see, I'm running out of juice from this one. Let's see if this one is better. Yeah, maybe. Um, which is another type alias. I could say something like type Point equals flow, float, star, float. And now I've, I've uh, um, created say, saying that the point is a, is a tuple of two floats. And if I want to do it something more generic, I could say type chord of t equals t star t star t. And now I could use this chord to say something like let c is chord of int equals uh, 1 comma 2 comma 3. So here I've used, explicitly used a generic type variable and then I say that I need to create a tuple with three elements all of the same type. If I would create a tuple with three different types I could say comma u comma w and then I could change these into u uh, w. But then I would also have to change here to int, int, float, and then we would change that well to zero. Similarly, so this allows us to play around with these types in in uh, various ways. Now, so what you see here is that defining a type in F sharp is a super lightweight, super super lightweight uh, operation. If you, if you go to most other languages, uh, defining new types requires uh, a lot of effort. So you tend to avoid using, using uh, types too much because uh, 
it's just a lot of uh. but actually if we will see in a, in a little example in a, soon is that in F sharp it's really encouraged to use type aliases and use these lightweights type all over the place all the time because they provide you with a lot of guidance on how the code should be used. If you have a function taking, just taking, we say f takes an int uh, string string. We don't really know anything about this. Maybe we should give a better name to f, but uh, to, to give us some hint on, on what what it does. But if I would write this function here is, uh, is uh, to call it repeat count message and we could actually get, instead of having this we could say string list and then it would return a message list. then it would be pretty clear what it does. And it only costs you one line. Well, or two. Int and count. And this is a really nice way to annotate our code. And that also means that whenever we open, whenever we open a Visual Studio code, it will help us with the, with the types. We will get good guidance. And that saves us from the worst thing that all developers know, and that is writing documentation. Right, so let's conclude uh, record types. So now we've seen the tuples, we've seen the generic, uh, how to define generic types. Now let's conclude this thing with a, with a, with a record type. And records are defined by saying type uh, uh, contact equals and then curly brace and then I can say first name string last name string uh, phone string email string And here we have a record type now. And here I just used, I defined a name, colon, and its type. Name, colon, its type. Name, colon, its type. Um, of course, I could have made type aliases for these things. So this could have been called first name. And then I would define the type alias for string for first name and so on to make it even more readable. In this case, it's probably a little bit overkill, but, but uh, yeah, I could. Um, okay, so if I would make this generic, I could uh, just add a type parameter t, and then I could say, well, email is, I don't know what type email will be, so I could just say that it's a uh, type t. That would be a bit silly. So we're going to just keep it like this. So I'm going to be using this contact uh, type in the next lecture as well, because we're going to be improving on it hugely. All right, so how do I use this contact type? Okay, I can say let c equals, and then I say first name equals Jonas, last name equals Eusebius, and so on, and then. And this would now get the type inferred to be of the type contact. Or I could give it explicitly. So, but this is essentially just a tuple with four elements. One of the important things like tuples, if I define something to be a, a tuple with four elements, is that I need to give every single element. I can't skip any. That's an immediately an error. So I can't just say, well, I'll just give the first and the last and the rest are, I don't define them. They must be defined. So how do I use this, uh, this contact then? Well, 
this is where where record types are more convenient than than tuples. So say I would need to get pull out the last name and feed it into a function that I will just call g, and I need to give it some some information. And I have a c which is a contact. I can say c dot last name. So I can use this dot notation to pull things out of records. Whereas with the tuples, we had this function called fst and snd uh, and so on to, to, uh, to sort of you would call that and that would return the, uh, the value. This is essentially the same in the background, except that now we have some pre-generated, nice na named functions to, to pull out stuff or from, from this object. And the last little thing we're going to say about record types is is that once we have a defined a record we can actually update that record there's a special syntax for updating records so if i have a c which is of a type contact i can now say curly brace so let c prime equals the new c c with um with email equals Jonas at hello.com curly brace end so this allows me to change this one uh, change one element inside of this record without having to rewrite everything inside of it and I could of course say C with email and on a new line or put a uh, semicolon I could change it a number of elements. If I have a big record type with, with the things, I can change exactly the ones I need to change. Now, the important thing to realize is that I'm not changing anything. I'm creating a new record where one element or two elements have been changed. Nothing gets updated. This is immutable. The C, once it's defined, it's defined. It will never change. But this allows us just to, to say, okay, take this one and produce a new one. But there's a big difference compared to language like Python and C and C++ and so on. And that's that since we know that C is immutable and it will never change, never. We can actually use all the information from the original C and just update, create a new element where this one single pointer inside of the structure which has changed and now points to a new piece of information. So this can be done very efficient. And that is possible only since we know that this can never change. It is, by the way, it is really immutable. Because if it could change, it would be mutable. If we would do this, then we would risk that somebody would go and change the contact somewhere and then this thing would also change and that's not good. And typically in C++ and C Sharp and where we are other languages, we end up doing a lot of defensive copying of things, doing deep copies of, of uh, structures, just because we cannot trust that other pieces of information inside of it won't change. So that was uh, sort of introduction to types in F-sharp. In the next lecture we will add another member to this family and we'll talk a little bit more about also about the, the record type and its meaning in a, in a slightly broader context. And that's the topic of algebraic data types and why those are immensely useful and why every language should have them. And it's a shame they don't. Until next lecture.